In this clip, I'm going to give a quick recap of how we organize code in Python into functions and classes. Another thing I'm going to talk about is type hints, which gives developers a better idea of what functions expect as parameters and what they return as a result. Being able to structure code into functions and classes is crucial when designing software. There are a million different ways in which you can structure your code. Most of those structures will not be very good. Some of them will be okay, and a few of them will be really great. In this course, overall, you'll learn about development processes that help you work as a team on producing good software designs. You'll also learn about object-oriented design techniques. And at the end of the course, you'll have a toolbox at your disposal that helps you create great software designs that scale well, that can be easily extended, and that work well in a variety of scenarios. The key ingredients of this toolbox are Python, functions, classes, and modules. Here's an example of a Python function that computes whether a given year is a leap year. There are a few rules that determine if a year is a leap year. Actually, it doesn't really matter what those particular rules are in this video. What you do see is that they translate into a rather complicated logical expression. Whenever you need to determine in your software whether a year is a leap year, you don't want to have to remember this expression every time. So it makes sense to put it in a function. A function is a group of code that is related. It provides an interface to that code via its parameters and it provides a return value. In this case, the parameter is an integer number representing the year. The return value is a boolean, true or false. So now, when you need to know if a year is a leap year, you simply call this function. That is the power of structuring code. Another level to structure code is by putting related functions into modules. You can create your own modules in Python, but Python also has a large number of built-in modules. For example, the math module groups mathematical constants and functions. Here you can already see that many design choices have been made. An example of such a choice is that math contains all mathematical functions. The creators of Python could have also decided to split this into several modules instead, algebra, geometry, numerical analysis, and so on. But they didn't, and for good reason. Python is a generic programming language, not specific for mathematics. So it makes sense that math functions are grouped into a single module. Otherwise, people wouldn't be able to find these functions. A class is another way of structuring code. A class does not only group functions, it also contains data that is related to those functions. Classes are used to define what objects or instances should look like. Here's an example of a two-dimensional vector. A 2D vector is an object that contains an x and a y value. It also has a couple of useful functions or methods, such as the length method. When you have a class, you can create objects and call methods on those objects that do something with the data. In this example, we create a vector, and then we compute it, its length. By putting the data, the x and y value, and the behavior, the length method, together, using this class becomes very intuitive. Here's another example. This is a rectangle class with an x value, y value, width, and height. There's also a method that computes the area of the rectangle which you get by multiplying its width and height. Yet another way to provide structure in your code is by using class inheritance. Inheritance allows you to group classes that are very similar and you can specify in what ways they operate in the same way. For example, a rectangle and a circle are both shapes and they both have an area. 
These shapes will be easier to use in your code if they all follow the same rules. So the function name, parameters and return value for computing the area should be the same for all shapes. You don't want rectangle to have an area method which returns an integer while circle returns a float. Inheritance allows you to specify such things. Here you see that there is a class shape that defines an area method. Rectangle inherits from shape and becomes a so-called subclass. You can also say that shape is the superclass or parent class of rectangle. Because rectangle inherits from shape, it needs to follow the rules laid out in shape. So this fixes the way that the area method looks like in rectangle. Similarly, we can have a circle class that also inherits from shape. Again, this means that circle, like rectangle, has to follow the rules of shape. By setting everything up this way, we make sure that shapes behave similarly throughout the code. But now, something strange is going on. We can create circles and rectangles because we have classes for them. But since we also have a shape class, we can actually also create a shape object directly, as you can see in this code example. But that's not what we want. Shape provides the structure that a subclass should have. But creating shapes directly is meaningless, since a shape is an abstract concept. What we really want to say is that shape is the interface or the contract that defines how shapes are implemented, but it's not an actual representation of a shape. This is where abstract base classes come in. They allow to specify that a particular class represents an abstract concept and you shouldn't make any instances of that class. Some languages, such as C-sharp or Java, have a special syntax that allows you to create these abstract classes and interfaces. Python has a module called ABC that allows you to do this. Here you see once more the shape class, but this time it's an abstract class. You can see that's an abstract class because it inherits from the ABC class, which is imported from the ABC module. If you try to directly create an instance of this class, you get an error. Another thing is that there is a so-called decorator keyword, abstract method, above the area method. This means that if a class inherits from shape, such as a rectangle, it has to define an area method with this signature. Python will show you an error if you forget to do that. So in short, abstract base classes allow you to define an interface of what subclasses should look like. And that means you can use these abstract base classes to specify the global structure of your code without having to implement the details. It also means that your code will be easier to extend. The rules for shapes are clear. So it's pretty straightforward now to add other shape types, such as triangles. Shape defines what the area method should look like. So when you add a triangle shape, you know how to get started. The idea of having abstract base classes and inheritance is the core of most of the design tools that you will encounter in this course. Also, since most modern programming languages have similar concept inside them, the patterns and methods you learn in this course can be applied to any programming language, not just Python. It's important that you're comfortable with these concepts because you're going to use them a lot. Practice with this. There are a number of exercises in the Quarterful platform that help you get a grip on this. One final topic I'd like to address is type hints. You may not have seen these before, but 
they are very helpful. Python is a so-called weakly typed language. This means you can define variables without specifying what the data inside them looks like. In this example, it's not immediately clear what kind of thing the OK variable is. After looking at the list largest function, you can deduce that it will be a single value in the list that you pass as a parameter. So in this case, an integer. Not having to specify types helps you in creating scripts very quickly. But there is a disadvantage. The code is not explicit about the data types it uses, and that may lead to unexpected errors. When designing software, it's crucial to know what data should look like. Type hints help make this clear. That's why in this course, I'll use them all over the place to make sure my code is clear about the expected structure of data. I really encourage you to make it a habit to do this as well from now on, whenever it helps to clarify what your code is expected to do. We've reached the end of this video. I hope this was helpful in clarifying the basics of code structuring in Python. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the Teams channel of this course. Thanks for listening and catch you in the next one.